Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. Hello, and welcome to Snacky Tunes. I'm one half your host, Greg Bresnitz. I'm the other half your host, Darren Bresnitz. Darren, good to hear from you as always. Good to hear from you. How was seeing Dan with Massimo again? It was great to see Chef Patora. He was back to talk about his new book, Bread is Gold, which is a compendium of the stories, recipes, and all the chefs who came out to support the first Refertorio during the Milan Expo of 2015. It's a beautiful book and really heartwarming and interesting look at how to transform all the leftover food in your kitchen into beautiful, delicious meals. Amazing. I cannot wait to hear it. We also have our good buddy Jameson Fink back in the mix to talk about how to survive a wine tasting. A lot of those tips can be applied to the holiday season with all the parties going around. And finally, we have an in-studio performance from Julieta, who talks about life on the road and her coming home ritual at eating the world's best kitchen, her mom's. Sit back, relax, and here we go with Snacky Tunes on HeritageRadioNetwork.org. We talk about food, we talk about music, with musical dudes, finger on the pulse, Snacky Tunes. Hello, and welcome to Snacky Tunes. I am one half your host, Greg Bresnitz. Back with Massimo Batora. Good to see you again. Hey. Welcome back to New York. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. So when we last spoke, at the very end of the interview, you talked about that you were having a book that was going to come out. <laughs> and here it is. Bread <laughs> here is, it is. Here yeah. it is. Bread is Gold. And a quick refresher for those who didn't listen to the uh, episode this uh, book is the documentation of the first six months of the Refertorio that happened during Milan Expo in 2015, yeah. whose tagline was Feed the Planet. And you opened up your version of a soup kitchen, invited 60 of your chef friends and culinary schools to come cook. And the concept was they were going to create unique recipes from leftover food at Expo. Yeah. I always thought that uh, those kind of soup kitchen, let's talk like that, uh, use that word, it, are like the concentration of quality of the ideas, power, power of beauty, and, uh, you know, the value of hospitality. So these are the three key points. Uh, and that's why I need in this, uh, you know, experimental, you know, soup kitchen, I need the chef because of the, the quality of the ideas. I need uh, uh, architect, artist, uh, uh, volunteers, uh, uh, power and uh, because we need the beauty, a place that are really beautiful to rebuild the dignity of the people and the quality of hospitality and the value of hospitality because welcome, right. goodbye are right. the two most beautiful words, you know, in, uh, in, uh, in life, you know. One of the most beautiful concepts that you bring up very early on in the book is the Mototanai from Chef Norisawa, which I thought was the best encapsulation of this project. Can you talk about what the depth of that word means and how it relates to the project? But it's, um, you know, I think that it's much wider, right. you know, because uh, each one of us brought uh, this deep culture uh, we have uh, and we, we, we are part of uh, in our own restaurant. Our own restaurant is called, it's come from ristorare, 
the Latin word to restore, uh, reficere. Um, and um, restore means you're, uh, you're coming to my restaurant after a long journey and uh, we need to take care of you and we need to restore not just your stomach. You don't come to our restaurant to eat uh, like abundance of food and stuff like that, but, you know, to feel good. And that's why, uh, you know, we try to rebuild all these um, places uh, through beauty. Because uh, in the moment they walk in, they feel so special. They sit around the table, they're like talking to each other, and uh, they create families, you know. This is the concept. And uh, in our restaurant, uh, that, that's the key point of make everyone feels home, even if you're like traveling uh, 10,000 kilometers, you know. So that's the, the key point of, of everything. And Chef Norisawa brought this concept, which is a Japanese concept, which talks about the regret of waste, which I think is such a beautiful encapsulation of yeah. a deep shame or regret yeah. that comes from Japanese culture. Yeah, but, uh, um, you know, I was just in Japan with uh, Jiro, and we were analyzing all these, uh, uh, actually, the real nature of sushi that was like uh, not to throw away all these different cuts of fish that were left over from uh, the market. They start adding some rice and things, you know, and uh, it became the sushi. And, and uh, when the real master, is like pizza, exactly the same way. Uh, and when the real master, they took over that, you know, and, they were, they, and the sushi became uh, the, um, the, what we know, um, is exactly the same way uh, the pizza became pizza because uh, before pizza was uh, just a focaccia just uh, some uh, cooked bread uh, you know, flat bread full of vegetables and leftover from the market and uh, roots and broccoli and carrots and things cooked in the oven and uh, serve uh, after, uh, after the, the market after hours you know. and it's exactly the same way sushi was, uh, was used uh, uh, 200 years ago. Then uh, Narizawa arrived, and uh, Narizawa, sorry, Jiro arrived, and they create uh, something much, much deeper and incredible. What's great about the book are the recipes. Yeah. Uh, and what easy. 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 Very creative, uh, with very cheap ingredients. There are ordinary ingredients. Right. I, you know, I stopped talking about waste. Because it's not waste. There are ordinary ingredients, and uh, I ask for to put on the cover of the book, you know, uh, 165 recipes with uh, ordinary, extraordinary recipes with ordinary ingredients. Because when you taste the, you know, the pesto with breadcrumbs, it's better than tradition. When you taste the soup that Rene did, the, um, the, the um, lasagna that Dani Lam did with uh, uh, switching pasta with zucchini, sliced very thin, and, or like uh, the um, piadina that Joan Roca they, 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 as, as an evolution, or the liquid croquetta that Ferran, you know, it's like, they're so incredibly easy to make, with very normal ingredients that you have in the refrigerator, me, you, um, every single person on earth has in a refrigerator. It's like, it's just that, uh, you know, I said to me, is the most important book of the last 30 years because th there are the most influential chefs in the world. They're dedicated, creativity, time, you know, vision to each one of us. So a book, you touch the, the, the paper, you have it, you open, you read the story, but also you can read the recipe. And you know, you, you, you can recreate with a little bit of creativity uh, in a very easy way because uh, there are no, we, don't, we are not using incredible tools or special technique, very easy, but the results are, it's, it's just amazing. Well, there's a, a common conception that creativity comes with constraint. 
So can you go through some of the stories or some of the chef's experiences when they opened the truck for the first time and they yeah. pulled out everything? Yeah. And I mean, these are chefs used to the best ingredients in the world yeah. and like what they saw and who was able to, you know, what was the process of seeing the ingredients and then transforming it into the recipes? Yeah. But uh, one of the story is like, is Ducasse story, you know? Alain Ducasse, like the mythic French chef who owns uh, many stars, Michelin restaurant, arrive uh, at like 8.45 uh, and the truck uh, usually arrive at 9. And so he was waiting for the truck. He opened the truck and he was like very, very, uh, you know, lucky because there was all these ingredients. And he was like, okay, we're going to do this, we're going to do that immediately. You know, the reaction it was like, Rene, for example, was very unlucky. Because uh, there was just uh, some uh, lime and, uh, you know, mushrooms. And, uh, you know, he was checking all these different, you know, leftover from the other chefs. But he came out with an amazing acidic soup uh, that reflect the north uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Europe. Or, like, I remember Alex Atala, that he was like, he was thinking to use uh, these, uh, all these coconut and it was working on the opening all this coconut and it, you know they were so hard and dry that he couldn't open and he, like it took like two hours to open this coconut and at the end into the coconut there was nothing you know <laughs> left so he decided to use uh, the half of the coconut uh, shell as a plate to serve uh, some pasta with some uh, coconut flavor inside, but also clams uh, and, uh, you know, a little bit of jalapeno spices. And, uh, yeah, that was very good. You touched on dignity earlier. Um, yeah. One of the things that I thought was incredible is that you didn't have a buffet system. You didn't, everything was served. But another thing that I think might be overlooked is that you had a psychologist on hand. Can you talk about how she helped work with the, you know, the vulnerable people and how she helped kind of educate the chefs um, and like what type of service and how to approach and what, what different approaches you might have had to do rather than your normal kitchen. Actually, we were very straight mm -hmm. and strict on rules. I'll tell you this. The first day in London, uh, there was a couple of guys. They were used to junk food. And... Um, they were like complaining about food and vegetables and soups and you know salads and and uh, uh, they were asking for French fries and uh, f fish and chips and I said no, um, we're not serving that food. I was very very strong on that because it it is totally against what we were thinking and uh, and so they left. They left. They didn't want to eat. And I said, okay, if you don't want to eat, this is our project. And we believe in this because beauty is beauty in every single way, in every single direction. They asked, the day after they came back and now they're like the most happiest guy. <laughs> you know, it, it, the, we have to be straight. We have to believe in what we are doing. Okay. So yes, there's psychologists, they're helping us, they're helping them uh, to, you know, but uh, after three years that we are almost going on with these projects, we know exactly what to expect. The first day in London, the same day, at the end of the meal, a 92 years old, beautiful, beautiful lady asked for a microphone. And she said, I'm very happy. I'm almost ready to cry. And I'm ready to die very happy because... After we have, now that we have a place like this, is a place so beautiful that it is going to create a community, our community. And this is uh, what makes me very, very happy. And I can die very happy. It's unbelievable. Everyone was like crying, you know. And, uh, but since day one, they realized what we were doing. In Milan, it took like almost one month to, to just to to make them understand what we were doing. Why do you think it took so much longer? Because there were several different people, many different cultures, very suspicious. Uh, it was a different moment, especially for Italy. 
all the migrants and polemics, the government and, you know, people dying um, in Mediterranean, you know, it's like, it's not easy. Based on what you just talked about, about how creating community and how it is transforming it, there's two kind of quotes from the book that really stuck with me. One is raising the quality of life through gastronomy, which you've demonstrated. But the other one that I really love is transformation takes intelligence. Yeah. You are dealing with some of the most intelligent chefs in the world. What were some of the techniques that they used to transform these everyday ingredients that surprised you and that you learned from? Surprise me? Uh, it's, uh, it's a very difficult thing for me because I keep always a door open for the unexpected. So it's not surprise, but it's something uh, uh, that I'm ready for. And uh, to me, the, like the moment in which uh, the Brazilian chef, uh, they were using uh, the brown banana peels, uh, boil them and make chutney with them, that was very, very, very good. And I use that in Brazil. You know, the Brazilian, they were transform, transferring that kind of culture and uh, technique to me. And uh, me, in Brazil, I was using that, transforming the banana peel into bacon to make uh, pasta carbonara. Instead of using bacon, we were using ba a smoked banana peel. You know, that, that was crazy. And no one realized that. Right. So that means that the, the, my, uh, what we were doing was really really well done no uh, one thought it was and we talked about this last time but no one thought it was less no one thought that they were getting you know a sec a step down or a lesser experience they just thought it was this is great and this is great and they didn't even think about but, it but no one is thinking about that right. no one that approach but you know all the our you know the people the people uh, they are like even working there all the chefs they, we all eat together and we eat what we are cooking so we are totally fine with that and we realize that the ingredients they're not like bad or or expire or whatever they're just uh, so different they're just uh, normal inc ingredients that you have in ev every day in your life um, you know the way and the sorbet like a beautiful, beautiful sorbet, uh, like apple sorbet by um, um, Albert Adria was fantastic, you know. It was like clear, white, deep, f pungent, amazing flavor. And that was one of the first desserts he'd made in, in years, right? No, the Albert and Ferran, they didn't cook together in, um, f uh, in 10 years. And, uh, you know, Ferran, before leaving the, the, the Milan, he said to me, Massimo, I just want to say thank you because uh, you, you make this possible for me to cook with Albert again. And, uh, you know, it, it was incredible, incredible. But even Ducasse, Ducasse in the kitchen, you know. You know, I've never seen it. Yeah. In, even 30 years ago when I was in Monte Carlo cooking with him, in, he was never in the kitchen, you know. Uh, so when you, when you see this kind of thing, I've seen, you know, one Maria Zak flirting with my in <laughs> mom-in-law, you know. And like, I can't believe that. I Most, that story. You know, that, that's crazy, crazy, crazy. Winter season is upon us, uh, which means less abundance of yes, fruits and vegetables. Yes, yes. Um, and a lot of chefs who are used to serving maybe not as seasonable re restaurants are struggling with the produce that is coming. Yeah. What advice or what um, kind of you know learnings do you think you can give chefs who maybe don't have the luxury of just serving people what's available, but having to keep up with the demands of the restaurant and also trying to use what is around yeah. them. But this is a question that uh, brings me with, uh, with, uh, with a thought to Burkina Faso. Burkina Faso is one of the uh, next uh, projects we're going to have. And uh, we realize that uh, there are, there's a lot of food, but there is nothing uh, to preserve it to preserve them. So what we, what we were thinking is like, instead of create a soup kitchen, uh, it's, uh, it's time to create also a, a small uh, company in which you can preserve uh, the fruit, the vegetables, and the things you have. Otherwise, they're going to go 
on 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 waste. They're going to be wasted, and uh, this is uh, uh, exactly what uh, I was thinking. And now I grew up. My mom and my grandmother they were using. Uh, tomato at their best, uh, uh, you know, zucchini and uh, eggplants, and they were preserving them. They were cooking, fry them, uh, saute, uh, um, chop them, uh, you know, and uh, they were putting in a jar and uh, a bamary. Uh, they were uh, storage in a cantina, no? And using during uh, the uh, autumn and winter, M- more winter than autumn, because autumn is still amazing. Think about the truffle, the uh, mushrooms and blueberries and things, and apple and pears and things. In Italy right now, we have uh, a lot of uh, citrus like mandarin, uh, because it's the microclimate from north to south. At south, uh, in south of Italy, there's still, uh, you know, and very good weather um you know so uh, you just have to follow the season buy seasonal whatever you have and uh, through your creativity create something if you buy fresh and seasonal you know you're gonna have you're gonna spend less you're gonna have less waste and uh, you're gonna have better food Bread is a common theme in this uh, book. I mean, Bread is Gold is the title, um, and I'd love for you to tell the story of that. But throughout the book, you talk about the multiple uses of bread, day-old bread, week-old bread. Yes. I see in Theater of Life, you see you saving all the bread. Yeah. Can you just talk about the, the concept behind you know, Bread is Gold, but then also how bread is woven throughout this entire, this entire story? But bread has other ingredients. To me... The most important thing is when you have this kind of ingredients in front of you, you have to have every single ingredient, the best one, and uh, you know, you have to ask the right question. You have to have a dialogue with them, ask the right question about w- when you've been baked. Today, hmm, you smell good, you're right. So. Please, let's serve it on the table. And people, they're going to be so happy to break it and uh, split it. If he's going to answer, one day hold, you're going to touch it, you're going to feel it, you're going to slice that, you, you're going to toast it in the oven, chop some tomato, some basil, some whatever, you know, mix with some apple and make bruschetta. If it's two days old, you can chop it, toast it, and make panzanella with uh, all these different things, you know. But if it's very old and hard, you can grate it and create breadcrumbs. And with breadcrumbs, you can do wherever you want. You can make a pesto, you can use uh, as uh, to pan fried, but also you can make noodle with uh, old bread, with breadcrumbs. Parmigiano, egg yolk, and uh, uh, breadcrumbs, a little bit of nutmeg, you mix the dough, you make the dough, you squeeze it into a chicken broth and make passatelli. My, my daughter and my son Charlie, favorite pasta. It's incredible. It's and, incredible. And what might not be known unless you read the book is that you had a lot of students come through. And what I loved is that you uh. taught kids about the importance of day-old bread yes which is a total reimagining for children to not think Fantastic. that old that old is old is old is still useful yeah uh, to me it's like this it's like what are you gonna do with your grandmother you're gonna throw it out because it's old mm-hmm. yeah you have to ask the right question you cannot ask her to wear like the most amazing t-shirt by gucci and uh, you know walk on a on a fashion show but if you ask her advice about your life She's going to tell you amazing things and amazing stories, and you're going to love it. And this is what exactly the same, uh, the same concept. So uh, this is the book is going to be about this, about suggestion, you know, wise uh, uh, advising about, uh, advice about what you do with this, what you do with that, what kind of technique, uh, how can you match, uh, because there are some, uh, you know, for example, you mentioned Narizawa before, there's all uh, milk soup uh, with vegetables, comes from his uh, youthness, and is totally different from uh, what we, we, we grew up with. You mentioned Nozawa's uh, childhood milk soup. 
a lot of the chefs pull from their childhood as inspiration in this book. What do you think it is about the ingredients or do you think it about the chefs that pull from that these ingredients inspire making dishes that remind them of their youth? Even the title is a story from your youth. Yeah. Um, the reason is that if you think about in the, in the past and your, in your memory, the most amazing and touching moment is when your mom was cooking for you and the whole family was around the table. We never, even me, I never complain about the risotto that was overcooked because I was late, because I was playing with my friends, you know, uh, on the street. And uh, I, was home, I, I was coming home and I was so happy to eat something that my mom was cooking for me. And that was an emotional food that was touching my heart. The mo my, my favorite meal in the evening before going to bed was a warm cup of milk with some breadcrumbs, a touch of chocolate or coffee, uh, and then uh, a couple of spoons of sugar. To me, it was amazing. It was warm. It was uh, made by my mom. Uh, and, you know, I grew up like that. And exactly as... as uh, the other chefs, they were, they were like talking about all this because we, re, we know, we know, you know, that when our goal is not to eat like a big plate of stuff, it's like we want to create emotional food. The crunchy part of the lasagna is about that. When you, when you break that crunchy part and you take like some, you add some ragu, some bechamel, and you taste it, it's like you are massimo uh, at seven years old fighting with his brothers over the crunchy part of the lasagna on uh, Sunday lunch. And that's the emotional part and what, what I want to transfer to you. And this is, a, this is something extremely special. And uh, uh, I think... Uh, in this kind of example, in this kind of, uh, um, you know, project, emotional part are 80% of what we are doing. For the design nerds out there, this book is beautifully designed, but m the cover must have been impossible. For those who have not seen it yet, it's a Tyvek cover. How did you land on that? How did you land on this material? How did uh, this come it's, about? It's Lara. Lara, Lara, Lara did that. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't involved in that. I was just involved on, uh, on uh, pudding and friends because, uh, you know, I thought uh, it wasn't just my book, but it was our book. And uh, all these books, all these book, uh, um, the books, uh, the, the, this book is made by. Uh, us all together, even uh, Karima, like Taka's, Taka's wife, who, t who took care of uh, tasting all the recipes with Lara, like driving to Parma in the test kitchen, re 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 create uh, every single recipe, try that, adjusting that, and you know, you know, it's it's just incredible, an incredible amount of work, you know, behind that. So uh, uh, we, ha we all have to thank Lara to, to pick and, and uh, decide. Uh, but even Emilia uh, from Fiden, she was like uh, writing us uh, every day about, so we, we should do this, we should do that, we, we can choose this kind of paper. We can. Every single detail of this book has been uh, thought and is... When I pulled it out of the, the envelope, I just went, whoa, this is not what I expected. And then the contents also, just to lay out the recipes, the note-taking, the photos, the stories. It's what you were expecting? Hardcover. Yeah. I mean, just mm -hmm. a hardcover. I mean, just, this just feels, per it immediately feels personal. Yeah. It, it immediately yeah. feels like something you would just have and that you don't find, like you wouldn't mind getting stuff on it or marking up notes or having yes. like drawn yes. it. And it. Like it totally feels yes. like you can immediately... It's exactly what I want. Yeah. It's exactly what I want. Because I would love each one of you to take notes and change uh, recipes, adjust the recipes to your palate. This is a fantastic. It's like you got the point immediately. And uh, I, really, I really appreciate you are saying this. Yeah. 
Last question. Yeah. Are you sick of bananas? No, no, I love, I still love uh, the Velvet Underground and uh, uh, the brown bananas. So that's, uh, uh, I love them even more because I've seen them in a very different aspect. You know, you see the the very ripe one and the, the one that like very uh, early, you know, yellow, almost green. And, uh, and the one that is totally brown and concentrate. I love them. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you guys. Thanks you. Thanks to you to to invite me here because uh, you know you know I love uh, I love you guys. Um, where can people get the book? And then most importantly, just so people know, all the proceeds will go to Food for Soul, which is incredible. This is this is another things that yeah. uh, I never say because uh, I think for me is obvious. But uh, uh, I said uh, and I always said that buy the book because you're gonna help to build many different refectorios all over the world. We're gonna set the example, and uh, the the all the profit they're going to Food for Soul. Um, and for chefs that want to come and volunteer their time, where can they yeah. go? Where can they go? And where but can they? Sign you know, up? you know, they're like, um, they're gonna. They have to contact uh, the refectorio where we have them. Uh, you know, and uh, they're gonna be welcome. Still now, uh, after years, people uh, you know are stopping in Milan or Rio de Janeiro or London, and they are working there. Uh, they're like, I, I remember like. Uh, after the 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 event with uh, Brent uh, the, um, of uh, Ladbury of Claude Bozzi in London, they were so touched by the experience that they said uh, we're going to send. Uh, all our staff to cook every day. I said, as I do in Modena with all the, you know, the day off, Monday night, you know, they're all uh, go there and cook for these people and they're having so much fun because cooking is a passion, you know, and, you know, you can transfer emotion through Amazing. passion. Well, thank you to our returning guest, Massimo Batora. The book, Bread is Gold, is out on Faden and can be found at foodforsoul.it or wherever books are sold. Up next, we have a live song from our archives by the band True Dreams and the return of Snacky Tunes 5's with Jameson Fink. Following this, we have a live in-studio performance and interview with Julietta here on Snacky Tunes. Hi, I'm Jameson Fink. I'm the senior digital editor at Wine Enthusiast, and I have five tips for surviving a wine tasting. It's not like a wine tasting is some sort of, I don't know, like, you know, arduous journey, like running a marathon or something that you, uh, you know, you really need to, you know, literally survive, but they can be daunting. And wine tastings I'm talking about are not just like hanging out with your pals or going to a winery, uh, something super chill. I'm talking about a full on big ballroom, big showroom, big warehouse type of wine tasting. Hundreds of tables, hundreds and hundreds of wines, lots of people. It's crazy. It's intimidating. Uh, it can be a little maddening. It can be exciting. It can be all these things. But anyway, <clears throat> I was thinking about this. I just went to um, Raw Wine in Brooklyn. It's this uh, big fair for natural wines, and there's uh, you know 
literally at least a hundred tables, uh, every kind of wine all over the world, you know, and there's like tea and, uh, there was a cognac table and there was mead and all kinds of stuff. So I was thinking about, you know, from my perspective, even I still am a little trepidatious about these big tastings. So um, the first thing I would say if you sign up for one of these tastings, like I said, it doesn't have to be a natural wine tasting. It can be, um, I don't know, Juicy McJuicerson's uh, port-like Cabernet Fest or anything in between. But um, the first thing I like to do is, you know, when you sign up for a tasting like this on a website, see if they have a map or a list of producers and kind of game plan. Think like... Uh, I like red wines. Um, I want to focus on red wines and look at the red wine producers. And a lot of times they'll, they'll list the wines that they'll be tasting at the event. Or maybe it's your geographical. You're like, you know what? I want to try South American wines. I've had a lot of wines from Chile or Argentina or Uruguay, uh, et cetera. You can, you can approach it that way. Or you're just, you know, like, um, I'm Cabernet. I love Cabernets. I'm just going to taste as many Cabernets as I can. And it can be really fun, too. Can you really focus in and actually, you know, learn a lot, focusing on one thing, whether it's a grape, a region, or a style of wine. So that's really fun. Uh, The second thing I would suggest is getting there early, like really early. Like, I'm the guy that Onion article about, like, you know, dad suggests you get to the airport, you know, 12 hours before the flight or flight leaves. That is me. That is totally me in every part of my life. But uh, I do like getting there early. If it starts at 10, I want to be there seriously at 9.30, lined up, because that's when when the doors open, that's your best chance to sort of have like an unencumbered, relaxed uh, kind of, you know, experience. Um, or going really late, but then you kind of hedge your bets that, um, you know, might run out of time. So just go get there early. And it might seem crazy, like this this tasting I went to started at 10 a.m., but uh, actually I feel that, you know, eat your Cheerios, have a cup of coffee, um, but I feel like that's the best time when your palate is its freshest and you really really have a great tasting experience because you haven't been, you know, uh, eating things all day or, or dulling yourself, or you're just tired, you know, you have a lot of enthusiasm in the morning, like, yeah, you're ready to go. Um, the third thing I would suggest is there's sort of, um, when it gets crowded and you're in front of a table, a tasting table and some winemakers, you know, reaching over and pouring and there's a bunch of people around there. You don't know, can I elbow my way in? Is it like the subway? Do I respectfully wait? Uh, what do I do? Um, I think you, you got to make your move and get in there. But, um, the other thing is, you know, there's a winemaker there. You're like, holy shit, I want to ask him so many questions or her so many questions. Um, uh, ah, I don't know where to begin. The other thing is there are a lot of people waiting behind you. So keep that in mind. It's not like you shouldn't ask any questions. Like I kind of feel respectively or respectfully that you kind of like take your pour and, you know, you, you know, you step back a little bit and let other people get in. If you have a question, you know, ask away and then just don't like, don't bloviate on or don't like, if it's even worse, it's not asking a question. Don't like go into a lecture about, you know, about yourself or what you know or how much you know. Just kind of get your taste, step aside, let other people in, move along. And, um, you know what, it's just like, it's like high school. It's like, I don't know, like, uh, you know, like all the pop, there's a lot of popular wineries and everyone will be swarmed around those super popular wineries. So, um, it's also a good chance just if you're like a crowd phobic, like me, just go to the table where no one's there. It doesn't mean the wines are bad. It might just mean no one knows what they are or they're, they're placed poorly in the scheme of things. And, um, you know, like I've done that, I've tasted a lot of really cool things. And then the best thing about that is you get a ton of time to jibber jabber with winemakers without everyone like, you know, stabbing you with their eyes in the back of your head. Cause you're not moving and you're hogging the time. The other thing I would mention is um, spitting. Uh, you know, you always want to uh, spit the wines. Um, you know, you really, I mean, if you had like one sip of every wine, you can have 100 sips, 100 sips add up, you're drunk. Um, it's not to say I don't like drink a little bit at these tastings. I usually like, like something's like super rare or super amazing. Like I will, I will drink it. And it's not like they give you a full glass anyway. Or, you know, like you can like circle the room and come back and like, these are my top five things I'm going to respectfully ask for to try them again. And I'm going to drink them. It's totally within your right to do that. But, um, and it's also kind of intimidating with the spit buckets because when it's crowded, um, you know, you're in the way of everyone. You're trying to spit out this wine. You're worried you're going to splash it all over yourself. Yeah. Um, the other thing I would say is to bring a coffee cup, like a, um, a, not a, not a mug, but a, uh, paper cup. And then you can spit into that cup and then dump it. And, um, it's totally cool. Don't even worry about feeling weird about that. And then finally, um, probably the best piece of advice I give you is after a day of tasting or afternoon of tasting wines, you know, whether they're even like, uh, massive Cabernets or Zinfandels or like racy high acid Rieslings or something like that. Your palate is really fatigued, very fatigued. And the best cure, in my opinion, is a beer. 
just after it's all gone, go somewhere quiet and drink like an ice cold, super cheap beer, like a a high life or something like that. It's going to taste super delicious. Uh, if you must get all, uh, you know, crafty, uh, I don't have like a half a Weizen or some kind of a wit beer or a session IPA, but just something crisp and clean, not complicated. And it's going to be the most delicious beer you've ever had. So go out there, go to these big wine tastings and have fun and don't freak out. Welcome back to Snacky Tunes. Julieta, welcome to the show. Hello. And hello, Thank Cornelius. You. Hey, how's it going? You are a born and bred New Yorker. Yes. Very rare breed. And you still live here. Most yes. of them like escape. <laughs> what is it that kept you in the city? And how did the city influence the music that you make today? Oof. This question is uh, difficult because I am very um, the type that loves to run away and uh, to just get out. But New York is just, everything is here, so it's kind of hard to get used to anything else. But I love to just get out and to explore and then realize how amazing New York is and then come back. Do you have a ritual when you come back? Is there a first thing that you do or a first place that you go eat at? My mother um, is an amazing cook. Uh, she's Italian. They're, my parents are Sicilian. And every time everyone's like, oh, what's your favorite restaurant in New York? I'm like, Ugh. honestly, my mom's kitchen. <laughs> what is mom's specialty? The pasta, like any pasta. Um, From scratch? Yes. Of course. Of course. Yeah. Sorry. I'm so sorry that I asked. <laughs> <laughs> it just shot me a look. It's, uh, how, how could you, <laughs> what other way is there to make pasta? I didn't know. What's a, I've never it's seen it. It's funny. <laughs> it's like this reoccurring thing because whenever my friends are like, you want to come over and uh, we'll make some food, we'll make a pasta. I'm like, yeah, for sure. I'm so excited. I come over and some pe- sometimes they open like jars of like pre-made sauce that they find somewhere and i'm like <gasps> what is this <laughs> we make our sauce from scratch at snacky tunes yeah I've, I've never been able to once we started making it from scratch i've never been able to go back there's just a thin wateriness that doesn't or sometimes if you have to get it from there you have to reduce reduce it mm-hmm. from the jar just so it tastes a little bit like something yeah, and honestly like it's so simple to cook you just like put things together and you just put a little bit of love into it and then you and get just some time. Yeah. Put on a f- couple favorite records and it's done. Yeah. Patience. And what else besides the pasta does, does mom cook oh so well? Uh, Milanese really well. And I grew up without frying things. My mom just doesn't fry. So everything is baked. So it's great because it feels like it's fried because it's really crispy, but it's healthy. Do you cook as well? <laughs> yes. What is your specialty? Um... My specialty would be just to throw a bunch of random things together and make it taste really good. <laughs> yeah, so it's like kitchen kitchen cooking. Yeah, yeah. Kitchen yeah. fridge. Super like home yeah. warm vibes. And you also spend your winters in the jungles of Nicaragua. I did this year. Yeah. Yes. How did you find that place or how did it call out to you? Um, I have a bunch of friends here that do really cool things. And um, one of them happens to be one of the guys that started Madera's Village. And what, what is Madera's Village? It's this community in Nicaragua where um, you can go and stay there. It's kind of like a hotel, but they also have a yoga community, music, surfing. So you get to do pretty much all of that um, with super cool artists that come through all the time. There's a really cool recording studio there. So that's why I was just like, yeah. You're like, hmm, <laughs> are you, o- <laughs> when, when's the studio open? That's when I'm coming. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And what was it about being in Nicaragua that inspired your music or helped fold itself into the way that New York inspires you? Well, they were, com- they're completely different. Um, there was no time there. There's no watch. There's no gotta go, gotta be there, gotta do this, gotta do that. It's kind of just like do whatever the hell you want. Um, and here it's always like, oh, sh- I have so many people I got to go see and so many things and the subway and this and that. So it was really just freedom that inspired me. Can we hear a song? Sure. What are you going to play for us first? I'll play you the song that uh, I wrote there called Beach Break with Jack Goodman that is in L.A. right now. Cause I'll move, I'll dance, I'll show you how to dance, baby I'll dance, I'll show you how to dance I'll move, I'll dance, I'll show you what I'm working with See you looking over my way Oh, I'll pretend as if it was the first What's the problem? Did I affect you? We saw this coming, 
But will you stay? Cause I'll move, I'll dance, I'll show you how to dance, baby. I'll dance, I'll show you how to dance. I'll move, I'll dance, I'll show you what I'm working with. Balla per me, bimbo, 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 bianco. We wanna dance, but we're swimming in a black hole. Pretty girl in the red dress. Never thought this could be such a mess Cause I'll move, I'll dance I'll show you how to dance, baby I'll dance, I'll show you how to dance I'll move, I'll dance I'll show you what I'm working with Show you what I'm working with Show you what I'm working with You mentioned Jack as your co-writer on that song. Yeah. It's pretty interesting how it came together. Yeah. You met him randomly. Right. So um, I had a runaway moment, and I decided to go to L.A. for a month and see what I could find. Um, And so I was there looking around, playing with some people, and then five days before I had my ticket to go to Nicaragua, I was uh, meeting with this guy named Jack. And he happened to go to the... I went to Emerson College in Boston. And he happened to uh, be there the same exact time that I was there. And I never met him before. But in L.A. we met. And he showed me all these tracks. And Beach Break was one of the tracks that was in his folder. And I was just like, these are amazing. I would love to write on these. Um, Thing is, I'm leaving in five days and I'm going to the jungle. You should come with me. There's a studio there and we could have an amazing time. And he's just like, who is this crazy girl being like, come down to South South Central America with me. Anyway, convinced him somehow. And um, is it really that hard of a sell? No. No. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Except for like people that don't know how to take risks. It's hard. Sure. If you're if you're adverse to adventure and saying yes, it's it's pretty difficult. Yeah. So anyway, second time I ever saw him was him roaming around in the jungle lost. <laughs> and I was like, hey, dude, <laughs> what's up? <laughs> so then we became close and we started writing together. And then, um, yeah, we brought the track back and another friend, Stray Echo, helped us tighten it up. And that's what it is now. And there's some sounds from the jungle that are on the track, on the recorded track as well. Yeah, in the opening, you hear the jungle sounds. That it was just so much going on there, and so beautiful that I wanted to somehow figure out a way to take a piece back. So I told him to go out there and record the sounds, and we ended up putting it in there, which is like a thing that I actually really love to do because I did it again with my next song. What are you gonna play for us next? Um, this next song is called "Hypnotize." I wrote it. Um, couple years ago with Stray Echo, but I never got to release it, so here's a little special thing for you guys. I was standing by the tracks as the sweat hit my face. And I was swaying to the memories of your mistakes And as my mind was floating off I felt you grab me in my ragged face And I didn't want to see you But we touched and now I want you to stay Hey, hey You got me hypnotized Oh, hypnotized Mesmerized Oh, hypnotized You keep on hitting me up as I'm making my way through the day. I try to close you out, but I can't seem to lose your face. You keep on creeping, always creeping, but I'd rather you just tell me. 
single runway has a similar origin to Beach Break about meeting a random guy yes, and having a, a chance encounter. Right. <laughs> you met at a party and he invited you to come see him in Italy. Right. Um, and at first I was like, that's crazy. Why would I do that? I mean, is it the same crazy that you I mean, come it to was, the jungle? <laughs> Jack and I were strictly like uh, professional. <laughs> And the runaway was more him just being like, why not? We should just, like, go and have fun. And um, I'm all about adventure. And as, like, some people are like, what the hell? I'm just like, what? Why not? (laughs) Uh, So, yeah, I went. um, And I got my Airbnb. I would be safe. But uh, but I went. And it was an amazing weekend just because... I just love being uncomfortable and finding ways to figure it out. It's just a great way of growing, you know. I like that he sent you the tickets in November, but the trip wasn't until about March. So March. <laughs> how did did he? How often did he check in? Every month he was like, "Hey, so are you still thinking about coming?" I'm like, "Yeah, well, the tickets there. I guess uh, we'll talk in another month. Let's see what happens." I mean, that's a really <laughs> slow and steady right. type of game. Right. Yeah. Totally. But I mean, like, I I'm living my life. He lives his life. I'm like, sure, we can have fun in a weekend in March. Just like I'll talk to you later when that happens. <laughs> how was the food? I mean, the usual amazing, yeah. It doesn't matter where you go, everywhere you're going to stumble into is amazing. Do you have a particular favorite food memory or coffee or spritz or all of them together? I mean, yeah, I had a amazing... Pesto is like such a simple thing, but when you do it right, it's like home. You know, it just feels like I'm in my bed, like cuddling. <laughs> so I had an amazing pasta con pesto and burrata, obviously. And But I was literally only there for like 48 hours, so it was just like four meals. <laughs> Six months for 48 hours? Yeah, quick. <laughs> Must have been a, a good chance encounter. <laughs> totally. But it's that's the reason why it was so crazy is because it was so short and such a like random thing. If, if I were to stay there longer, it probably wouldn't have been so like fiery. you know. Right. It's like first night, last night. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so good to see you. I can't believe I'm leaving. Bye. <laughs> Bye. How did the song come out of it, the trip? Uh, so basically... Uh, my friend Stray Echo sent me the track uh, for Runaway to write on, and as soon as I got it, I was about to run away, so I wrote the chorus, I'd run away with you. And then while I was there, when I was getting to know him and getting to know the situation, I started writing the verse um, and the sounds I took right away because I knew that it would be like a cool thing to add to it. And what are the ambient sounds that you... Where are you located when you recording the field? So the first... The opening is me walking um, along the Fiume, the river, uh, next to the old bridge that they have there. And I was literally walking to go meet him. And I thought, I was like, fuck it, I'm just going to take these sounds. And then when I was leaving, I was like, I should just do the same thing. And when I was getting on the airplane, I took out my phone and, and even got the stewardess on there. And you have a sh- record, or song release uh, party coming up later this week. Yes, we are performing at New Blue um, on Avenue C. Thursday night around like 8 p.m. And what can people expect for a song release party? I mean, just super cool people, my friends and fans, and also another friend of mine, Cole Trickle, is going to be DJing and he plays great music. So it's just going to be like good vibes. Amazing. Yeah. We want to make time, make sure we have time for one more song, but where can people find you, get the songs? Uh, Yeah, we're on Spotify and iTunes and all the above, SoundCloud. My website is juliettanyc.com. You can find some stuff there. Or you can just look up Julietta um, online and find the songs. 
Perfect. Yeah. Well, we want to thank Jameson for kicking off our Snacky Tunes 5. Big thank you to Kong and Darren as well, and David out there in the booth. Thanks for listening. We will be back next week with another live episode of Snacky Tunes. What is the name of the song that you're going to take us out with? Runaway. Perfect. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks for coming by. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for, for listening. Us. We'll see you next week. For the right things to say Let it go, let it spill into my mind I promise I will help you realign I'd run away with you, away with you Everything you want to say to me, say to me I would take it anywhere for you for a way I'd run away with you, away with you Everything you want to say to me, say to me I would take it anywhere for you, where for you I've been looking for a way You're scared of what I'd find But baby, if the sun is what you need Oh, I, I'll bring you the heat Perdiamo ci